Hello, John McConnell here with uh, UnderwaterRealEstate.com. Welcome to our film studios here in uh, San Diego, California, actually Carlsbad to be specific. And today we're going to talk to you about a, a few points that all mesh together. But the main point being that the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act, both the federal one and the California one, expire in 2012. Now, that means that if you or your client were to start their strategic default or walk away or their foreclosure uh, today and they were to go late this month or more likely next month there's a reasonable chance that that foreclosure will not be completed by the end of 2012. I'm an attorney I've advised hundreds of people on foreclosures and walkaways uh, I speak to people every day on the phone and uh, occasionally a, um, a bank hits the bare minimums with respect to notice sending out the uh, the notice of default then, the letter of acceleration, the notice of default, the notice of sale, and they hit the sale date at a minimum. And if you were to start that right now as we're speaking in February, it's going to be cutting it close. But we also know that um, on the more expensive houses, the banks take them back more slowly. So if you're, uh, you're the type of person who's worried about owing a deficiency, you probably have a significant deficiency. Your house is probably in the three, four, five hundred thousand dollar range or more, and most banks are not going to hit you uh, with their bare minimum, which is probably about start to finish. And again, I'm a lawyer. I don't want to be sued on this. I can go over this specifically with you in your case. But let's say even if the minimum is four or five months, by the time, depending on the, if there's in a three-year mark when they put the loans out, by the time they figure out everything and that you're late and you haven't been paying them, it takes more than seven, eight, nine months for most foreclosures. Now, the other thing is, what if you're going to consider a short sale or some other loan workout, a short payoff to the second? Or... Um, even a uh, loan mod where you get principal reduction, as rare as they are. If, th if that doesn't happen in 2012, you've got a whole new set of circumstances. Because when that 1099 comes out, that 1099 is like income. It's, like, it's, it's, it's as if you had a job, as far as the IRS is concerned. When that income hits you, um, it can certainly create a large income tax bill. Um, it, who knows? It maybe even puts you in a different tax bracket, depending on how it's dealt with by your, your, your tax people. So. If uh, you might be doing something as simple and as what has been a relaxed thing, uh, doing a loan uh, modification with principal reduction or a short sale on a principal residence, and you haven't really had to think about this since the last two years. Realtors haven't been tested. They haven't been handing out their short sale information addendum, which actually scares you into believing, wow, I've got issues here. I need to speak with a lawyer. Well, we're back to being concerned about your future. You're going to have to know the difference between recourse or non-recourse loans. And uh, during the course of this video, we're going to cut to, because I'm not going to write it out here. We tried to do it with the TV. We still got to work on the lighting. We're going to cut to uh, slides, and then we'll come back. Uh, and if, we might close it up on the slides, or maybe we'll come back and do a little video shoot. But our first slide is going to talk about the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act, cancellation of debt income, what it means to you, recourse, non-recourse loans, and how uh, we'll go into a little bit on this video and how that's going to, your situation will be different depending on whether you have non-recourse or recourse loans, what strategy sh you should pick. And then finally, for number three, uh, for the realtors out there in the crowd, we're going to talk about how informed clients can mean more clients. How if, if you're going to utilize a consultative approach and you team up with uh, uh, people that are experts or at least very knowledgeable in their field, you put those teams together, you will become, you will, you can, you can pick up 20, 30, 40 listings in 60 days, like, like uh, a couple of realtors in my office. So um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to cut to the video. Thanks. Hopefully this will be seamless. John McConnell, UnderwaterRealEstate.com. What is cancellation of debt? If you borrow money from a commercial lender and the lender later cancels or forgives the debt, you may have to include the canceled amount in income for tax purposes depending on the circumstances. That means they're going to, if they do a short sale with you or you take a foreclosure or they do a principal reduction in a loan mod uh, or a short payoff, the lender's going to send out a 1099, most likely, although they may send it out a year late. And when you're answering your IRS tax return questions, you're going to be asked if you had any debt forgiven that year. So it is possible that you will be developing income by um, doing some sort of loan workout this year. What's the rationale 
Well, let me quickly just say my rationale for it is I remember as, as a kid uh, when free agency was starting, some of the players were getting million-dollar loans and being told they didn't have to pay them back. Well, that was clearly income. Here's an IRS example. It's very simplified. You borrow 10000 and default on the loan after paying back 2000 If the lender is unable to collect the remaining debt from you, there's a cancellation of debt for $8,000. Is the debt always taxable? No. That's uh, why we're here talking to you today. The first part is a, that it seems like most of my clients have used is a Qualified Principal Residence Indebtedness Act, the Mortgage uh, Debt Forgiveness Act, which ex expires this year, and that's why this is going to be significant. We're going to show the difference for people, what happens if they've got recourse loans and uh, they get their short sale or loan workout done this year versus next year uh, in future slides today. Uh, another exception can be bankruptcy, although you have to watch out. There's lots of information from bankruptcy, bankruptcy attorneys about saying that you can't discharge the IRS debt, so you have to do things the right way. Farm debts, don't know anything about. Non-recourse loans, I know a lot about. We will talk about non-recourse loans versus recourse loans and, and your strategy in the very next video. Insolvency, uh, we will give a definition later. And then there's two other ways. One, uh, you can find it on the net. If you've got recourse loans, maybe being able to turn it into a business for certain homeowners. And then uh, a more aggressive tactic, which we will definitely dis discuss in detail. I've prepared all the slides. I just haven't given the speech yet. Uh, we're going to use case law and we're going to use uh, some understanding of the law to help you with an option related to disputing the debt. We'll go into that in detail in the next slides. Uh, next video, sorry. Um, normally, debt forgiven or canceled by lender must be included as income on your tax return and is taxable. But, as we just said, the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act and others can help you exclude that income. The Act allows exclusions on income realized as a result of modification of the terms of your mortgage or foreclosure on your principal residence. And the Act, as we know for the third time, is, is slated to expire at the end of this year as of the date of these videos. Now, um, here's a very, uh, this is a more detailed description, but we're looking at debt used to buy, build, or substantially improve your home. Ordering rule. If only a part of your loan is qualified principal residence indebtedness, the exclusion applies only to the extent the amount discharged exceeds the amount of the loan. That is not qualified principal residence indebtedness. Here's this example is better. For example, assume your main home is secured by a debt of a million dollars, which 800,000 is qualified principal residence indebtedness. If your main home is sold for 700,000 and 300,000 of the debt is discharged, only 100,000 of the discharge debt can be excluded. The remaining $200,000 of non-qualified debt may turn out to be income to you unless you find another way to exclude it. We will uh, continue this on the next slide. You may see a little rough cut here. Hello, uh, this slide is here to point out that there are limits to the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act and to point out the fact that this is the federal framework we're looking at. Your state may have no Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act framework. Maybe you live in a state without any income tax like Florida, or if you live in a state like California, where the, uh, the, the, the state usually mirrors the feds, but in this case, they have lower uh, numbers here. They, they don't go up to 2 million and 1 million. So for all loan workouts, you need to con consider federal consequences and state consequences. Here's a question we get all the time. Net used to refinance your home qualifies for this exclusion, but only to the extent that the principal balance of the old loan immediately before the refinancing would have qualified. I think the distinction being made here is that if you've paid down your debt and then you refi, your mortgage debt forgiveness limit would be where that number was after you paid it down. Uh, again, if, you, if this is a concern for you, you, you need to go over it very carefully. Do you have to report it on your tax return? Um, and I see there's a two-part answer. Yes. Um, if, you're, if you believe that you have to pay your taxes, then you probably need to report it. However, I have a client who just, we just completed a short sale for them in December. 
they uh, they asked if they were going to get their 1099. The bank said, oh, no, we didn't get your paperwork until this January, so you're going to get your 1099 next year. I advise my client, based on my reading of the tax code and, and, and experience, that he should be reporting it in the year that it was forgiven. So regardless of the fact that 1099 is coming out, I've advised him to pay it basically the year before the 1099 comes out. And then we've got a letter for him where he can explain to the IRS next year the 1099 was sent out a year late. Uh, here's a question. Um, insolvency. Um, you are insolvent when your total liabilities exceed your total assets. And remember, insolvency means this as well. Assets include everything you own, your car, house, condominium, furniture, life insurance policy, stocks, other investments, or your pension and other retirement accounts. Now, I'm giving you the federal definition. This, your state definitions may vary slightly or may vary significantly. Capital gain concerns. I want to remember, I want to re remind everybody that if there are uh, some of the exclusions, it's not really a concern, like when you have a non-recourse loan. But if you're going with the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act ex exclusion and you're filling out Form 982, you'll see you will have to deal with reducing, you may have to deal with reducing the basis in your property, which would likely create a larger capital gain than you would have mentally been anticipating. Luckily, there are capital gains exclusions as well. But um, you should take your time to figure out and plan your strategy bef and, and what exceptions you're going to use before you begin your short sale. And, and I believe realtors should be advising their clients of that as well. Um, now, in California, the, there is a short sale information addendum. I believe all realtors, for liability reasons, should want to make sure their clients get that before they really sign anything. And uh, all clients should ask for it and review it. Um, and there's a lot of good information there. In fact, it, it lays it out very or in a very organized manner, and uh, it will prompt some questions. But you're you're you know that's a good thing. Um, we we have videos on the car short sale denim for clients. You can find them out there on the net. But uh, we think it's a really good one. Uh, we we think the SSIA is a really good one. Now, let's talk about short sales. Remember, only 25% of realtor negotiated short sales result in a sale. Um, therefore, if um, you're starting a short sale now, you've got a chance that even a normal short sale, especially if there's third party behind the scenes insurance with AIG or somebody, your short sale may, might take longer than nine months. I mean, some go in two or three. Some of ours do take two or three. Some go nine months. We had a couple that even went longer than that because of internal, internal concerns over at the bank. And the other, you know, with most realtor negotiated short sales, they're not even going to succeed. So you, before you begin a short sale, before... Yeah, we, went, we ran out of time in that previous video. So um, here we are. Uh, there's two things. One, if you start today, there's a chance through no fault of your realtor... That or if you're a realtor, through no fault of your own, the short sale takes more. It, it won't close in 2012. You could be dealing with third-party insurance, where the second or the first got insurance from AIG, and AIG doesn't want to pay off until there's six months of non-payments, and then after that, the short sale negotiation begins. You could be dealing with uh, an investor who's trying to force the loan back on the um, originator. Those seem to take time, so. Even if you're an aggressive realtor with lots of skills or or you uh, use a lawyer to do your negotiating, it could take more than the remaining time. Also, since only, according to NAR, 25% of realtor negotiated short sales result in a sale, um, your clients, or if you're the homeowner, you need to know that um, what your options are with respect to and what your risks are if this goes out to next till 2012 and we will discuss uh, the big risk is for those with recourse loans that I see and we will discuss that in the next video or two and we will discuss it briefly in a coming slide so um, 
On the next video, we will discuss recourse versus non-recourse loans. And if you have a recourse loan and expect a big 1099, we will discuss in detail your options for minimizing your income tax on it. Um, however, before we go there, I'm going to uh, just, while we're here on the front page, I'm going to do a little quick rundown. If you only have one loan, let's let's compare it. The, and, and then you can use the same analysis for two loans. Let's look at that first loan on a principal residence. If you've got the original loan on a principal residence, you've got a non-recourse loan under CCP 580. B, or at least you probably do. You also probably qualify under the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act because that would be your original mortgage debt. So when you get that 1099, you'd have a choice. You'd say, I'm going to exclude that income because it's a non-recourse loan and I settled it in the right manner according to the way the tax cases state, at least the IRS tax cases state. Or you could say, I will use my Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act exclusion, go to Form 982, fill it out, reduce my basis, deal with the capital gains, and be done. Now, if you've refinanced the original loan, but you didn't take any cash out, if, you, if your short sale or foreclosure closure happens in 2012, you're going to be covered by the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act, and hence may not have any taxable income. However, if that recourse loan if that refinance loan cannot be considered a non-recourse loan, and we'll go over the rare exceptions where it can, but generally, once you refi, you're not going to have a non-recourse loan anymore. See your lawyer for exceptions. Um, if that recourse loan gets settled next year, you're going to get a 1099. You're not going to have the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act to exclude that income. You're not going to be able to say, you may not be able to say it's a non-recourse loan. You probably won't be able to say that. So you're going to get a, six, a potentially six-figure 1099. That can hammer your income. What are you going to do about it? Well, you're going to look at your other exclusions. Maybe insolvency works for you. Maybe before you go into your short sale, you should rent the property out or rent the property out during your short sale if the turning into a business is a way to treat it. And we can also talk about disputing the debt. But if, if you've got a big 1099 on the way and you've got a recourse loan, your client, if you're a realtor, has to understand their options. And if you're a homeowner, you definitely want to figure out your options before you go into a short sale or a walkaway right now. Um, fill out the, uh, give us your email, and we will uh, instantly introduce you to the next video in this series. Um, thank you. John McConnell, UnderwaterRealEstate.com.